Good morning, Blue Ridge. My name is Natalie Bassey, and I'm a part of the comms serving team here at Blue Ridge. We're so excited that you decided to join us this Sunday morning. I know that we may be entering into this Sunday morning with some heavy hearts, heavy spirits, heavy souls, with everything that's going on in our world today. So with all of that in mind, the song that we're gonna start off today's service with is a song titled In Control. And I find it to be very timely for everything that's going on. When everything feels out of control, we can trust that we serve a God who's constantly in control no matter what. So I encourage you to catch your breath, find a place where you can be quiet and you can be still before the Lord and really focus on a God who is always sovereign and always in control. God, I look to you. You're the beginning 
Thank you once again for joining us this morning. My name is Natalie Bassey. I'm a part of the comm serving team here, and we are going to continue in our time of worship by giving. You can find many ways to give by going on our website. It gives you all the directions. There's so many ways to give, so feel free to check it out. And I have some exciting news for the youth. So if you are a youth here at Blue Ridge, listen up. BR Youth Life Groups are back, and they're back in two different ways. We have community groups, and discipleship groups. Each is unique and you can find all the details for each group online. And once again, registration opens today, January 17th. Last year, we had such an amazing turnout. So many students in our youth program were so impacted by this. So this is something you do not wanna miss out on. Now we're gonna continue in our series, Fixed on Jesus, by joining Woody in the studio. I knew I was in <clears throat> trouble when the log broke under my feet because I was maybe six or eight feet in the air and I had a heavy pack on. I'm in a wilderness environment, so I'm a long ways from any help. And I was right. I fell that six or eight feet to the ground and hyperextended my uh, knee, one of my knees. Uh, one of the, the guy who was in charge of the whole program, he said, he was a gymnastics coach, and he said that, you know, people like me with loose muscles, uh, they hyperextend. If I'd had tight muscles, uh, I would have broken the leg, but at any rate, a few hours later, I'm uh, making my way out of this wilderness situation. I have a long ways to go. I'm in a lot of pain. I'm propped up on a stick that I found somewhere, and <clears throat> as I am making my way along, I'm having a conversation with God. Actually, I'm having a conversation at God, and I'm saying to him, uh, basically, what are you doing? Why are you treating me this way? Why does this stuff have to happen now? <clears throat> Don't you really care? Um, you're just not doing this in the way that shows me that you care for me. And so I don't understand it. But as I walked along with that conversation going on in my mind, in my heart, I made a choice there, and that choice changed everything for me. I mean, even really, I know it sounds melodramatic, but even for the rest of my life, the way I approached life, <clears throat> and I want to, I just want to share what I learned, and it's a biblical thing, and how it hopefully will address where you are. Because I know just from my conversations in the recent past, and you don't have to take this as if I'm revealing a secret view because none of these are uh, specific and none of them are just one person. But I've talked to so many people here recently and people who are, they've adopted, for example. And they did it because they felt like this was what God wanted them to do. But it's caused chaos in their lives, in their families. Or maybe they've, or tried, they've tried to have a child, you have tried to have a child, and you've done everything you know to do, and, and you can't. Or perhaps <clears throat> you've uh, just been laid off, and, and you were laid off, and other people, they really uh, are not as, they have not been the kind of employee that you have. So what happened there? Or maybe you've had a child, and this child has some disability, this child, you know, whether it's physical or whatever, and you're wondering, why did God saddle me with this? I know that's a bad thing to think, but in your darker, uh, more personal moments, 
You just wonder, did I do the right thing? And what is, what's up here with God? <clears throat> or maybe the, the marriage didn't work out. You wanted it to, but it just plain didn't work out. Or you put all of your savings into starting this business. You prayed about it. You thought this is what God wants. And now COVID hits and, <clears throat> and you realize we're going belly up. And I'm going to lose my life savings. What am I going to do with the few people or the many people who work for me? Or I've got this degree. I've got $95,000 in educational debt, and I'm working at Starbucks. What about that? Where is God in all of this? Well, that's a question I'd like to address. I think all of us have probably had those thoughts, as I've said. I know I have. So uh, what's what does God have to say about this? What was it that changed my experience? Well, we're in the book of Hebrews. We have been for a couple of weeks. And if you've been with us, you'll know that Hebrews chapter 12 starts with a therefore. So it's building on what went before it. And what went right before it <clears throat> is chapter 11, which has that whole hall of faith that all those people in the Old Testament who... Uh, walked by faith were, were just models of faith. And Jeremy talked about that the first week. And uh, as, we, as you have, I've memorized it, as you memorized it, you can sort of read along with me and remember with me what it says because it starts out like this. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight, lay aside every encumbrance, you know, the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Let us run with endurance the race. So the, the point of the book is about endurance and it's running a race. And it's, it's not just any race. It's not a hundred yard dash. It's a, a longer race with all kinds of obstacles. I was talking with a friend recently who just moved away because of his job, but he was telling me about a, uh, a race that he ran not long ago, 112 miles, 30-some hours, I believe it took. And he told me what it required. And it required things like training and conditioning, of course. And it, there were other pieces, nutrition and support system. Uh, yeah, but, but a mentality that you entered the race with. You know, this race metaphor is not an unusual one or unique one. When you look at the, uh, New, the New Testament, you, uh, you'll see, like, you know, Paul the Apostle writes about this very same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs? So here, you know, this race we're in. Now, obviously, we're not just talking about physical, athletic races. We're talking about the Christian life. We're, when we follow Jesus, we are automatically enrolled in a race. And we run the race. And look, look at his perspective on it. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. So, you know, you can just repeat with, you know, with me or after me, I'm in a race. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're in the race and we are to run to win. Just say that we're to run to win. I am to run to win. Now, what does that look like? Because it's a long a race, like an ultra marathon, like cross country. All the all athletes are disciplined in their training. So this here we're introduced to a very uh, important and obvious element in any race, which is discipline and training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. Listen to this, this last verse. I discipline my body like an athlete. There's our, our word again. Training to do it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. And so Paul is saying we're in a race. We're to run to win. That we need training and discipline. And that we can be disqualified if we drop out of the race, which has huge implications. All of a sudden, this is not just as oftentimes Christianity is presented as just something that we, you know, we can do it, not do it. It doesn't matter once we get, once we sign up for the race. That's not the way this works. 
And so if it is a race, if it is a marathon, if it is an ultra, then what keeps us from falling out of the race? This is really important. In fact, in, in verse 3, I mean, you may remember last, <clears throat> last week, Jeremy talked about the second verse, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the one that is running in front of us. We fix our eyes. I, mean, I remember years ago, I was in Europe, and I don't know whether it was a cathedral or uh, a castle or whatever, but it had those huge carved doors with that what's called bas relief. That is, it, you know, the figures are three dimensional and then they're carved right out of the wood. They rest on the surface of the wood. They're part of the wood. And I'll never forget, you've got this knight who's riding in the darkness. He's riding toward a castle on a hill, you know, a long ways in the distance. And all of these uh, tendrils and branches with, you know, sort of a evil. Uh, malicious intent, or, or really trying to, they're coming out to get him, to encircle him, but he rides right down the middle of them with his eyes fixed on the castle. He knows where he needs to go. And Jesus says, I'm running the race. I have run the race. You follow me. You do what I did. And so uh, the problem then becomes that we need, as Jeremy said the first week, we need a fourth quarter kind of faith. We need something which will help us to endure. I don't know about you, but maybe you are, as he says, so you won't grow weary and give up. Maybe that's where you are. You're <clears throat> weary. You want to give up because you've tried it. It doesn't seem to work. You don't understand what God is doing. You're just worn out with the whole thing. You're afraid that you will fail again, that you're, you're demoralized because of your failures. You're just weary. What is the solution to this? How can we run this race? If we have the assumption we're in a race and that we want to finish the race. We want to win the race. Not just we're trying to beat everybody else, but we want to endure and to run it well. And at the end of the day, the end of the race, to hear God say, you did a good job. That's what I want to hear. So what do we do? How do we do it? Well, as we look at the following verses in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, we read this. He says, have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one of us who accepts, he accepts as his child. So what is it, what's it telling us here? Well, one is it says, uh, well, let's, let's just look at the word, maybe the word discipline. Paideia is the Greek word and it, it's just the word for child, but it has an implication with a, an additional ending on it of a word which refers to discipline. Now, we know that discipline, anybody that has, even knows anything about parenting, is that every child needs discipline, maybe uniquely. I mean, in my own life, I grew up and I got what we called a lot of whippings. Now, I know that's kind of out of vogue right now, but to be honest with you, uh, even then, I knew that my parents, my dad was doing it, as it says here, you know, the Lord disciplines those he loves. I knew, he, now I didn't like it. When daddy would say to me, uh, I'm, I'm just doing this because I love you. I always, I kind of wanted to say, I wish I was big enough to return your love. <laughs> but I knew better. And even then I knew it, but as time has gone on, I have seen the benefits of it. In fact, I have told people, if we're not for that discipline, that's the, you know, the, the corrective part of it, then I would, I would be in jail or dead. <laughs> personally, given my temperament, et cetera, et cetera. You see, discipline, we know, extends far beyond just, you know, giving people uh, the consequences of their sin, their wrongdoing. It really doesn't refer, refer to that in eternal terms. That is, Jesus took our punishment. He took our discipline in that sense. We don't have to worry about that. But we know that there are consequences to sin. We know that sometimes it's, it's preventive. It keeps us from doing stuff that is destroyed. Paul, the apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, God sent this thorn in the flesh. We don't know what that was, but it was very painful, very troubling. He prayed that you know, he would get rid of it. Uh, but he said, I know why this happened. It was to keep me from thinking too highly of myself. Or the book of Job, that's a famous Passage. And in the book of Job, we have 
Job going through all these bad things. Because that's kind of what we're talking about here. This bad stuff that comes into your life. By bad, I don't mean just morally bad. I just mean uncomfortable, painful things. And life is full of those things. How do we receive them? Job didn't know what was happening. He didn't even deserve what was happening to him. And so he asked God, why, why, why? And God uh, responded right at the end of the book. And Job didn't learn the reason, but he did learn a lesson. In fact, he learned a lot of lessons. He learned lessons about who God was. He learned lessons about, surely he did learn lessons about God's uh, graciousness and his love. He also learned that God basically was saying to him, I'm large and in charge, <laughs> that I am God. And frankly, I'm not beholden to answer why I did this. I mean, you, if you think about children, you know, they, don't, they, don't, they may ask why. They may not even understand why, but it grows out of the parent's love for them. It is designed for their good. And that's what God is saying here. And, and I'll answer some of the questions you have here in a few moments. But when bad stuff comes into our life, when painful stuff comes into our life, when stuff that we don't understand comes into our life, we know that God, if we know God, we know that he's somehow involved in it. And so how does that work for us? Well, as he goes on to explain this, <clears throat> he says, as you endure this divine discipline, so we got to endure it. It's divine discipline. It's God's discipline. Remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? Well, we know that, you know, what happens with children, the Proverbs, the book of Proverbs says, a child that is not, you know, that gets his own way becomes a shame to his parents. And so we know the necessity of discipline. And all, and I'm talking about discipline again, not as just punishment. I'm talking about it as the development, the training of a child. If God doesn't discipline you as he does, all of his children. So God disciplines all of his children because he loves them. It means that you are illegitimate and not really his children at all. When I'm in the your grocery store, and, I, and you may disagree with me here, but if I see a child who is misbehaving, being disrespectful, maybe destructive. Um, and, and I have a tendency to say, ooh, that's not right. What do I do? I don't do anything. Why? Because it's not my kid. That's why. And so, which brings up, you know, just sort of a corollary to that is that when people who profess to be followers of Jesus and children of God, when they can continually and consistently uh, be involved in sin, deliberate kinds of sin, and nothing ever happens from God, then you have to ask the question, a very basic question, do they even belong to God? Because that's the reasoning here. Now, he goes on to say, now this is our response to it. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirit and live forever? You see, our, we are to submit to this. That is, whatever comes into our life. I'll explain that in just a moment, the extent of that and the implications of it. But God often uses the things that come into our life which are painful, sometimes deliberately as a result of our sin. We know that sometimes we just, you know, we've experienced bad things because we just did stupid things or other people did stupid things, or somebody else has you know, ill will toward us, or we don't have any idea why. But when this happens, when these things come into our lives, we can, we can either shake our fist at God, we can ignore it, we can separate it from God, or we can see it with a new perspective, a life-changing perspective. We can, as it says here, we can submit to God, and it because He's the Father of our spirits. Not just uh, this is not just our physical lives, our physical existence. It is what He's doing is developing us spiritually, and then we can live. Because you and I both know that disobedience, while it feels good in the moment, it brings death. Jesus said this. He says, you know, He talks about uh, the one who comes to kill and steal, destroy. We know that when we uh, violate what God has said, that we experience death. It may be the death of purity. It may be the death of truth. It may be the death of character. It may be the death of joy. In the moment, it feels good, but in the long run, it's destructive. And Jesus comes and says, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. 
But in order for us to have that experience, that then there are certain things we do. And one of them is that we submit to God. Now, submit how, what, when. Well, let's just finish this passage. <clears throat> uh, Since we respect their earthly fathers who discipline us, shouldn't we submit even more to God who is our heavenly father? If our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years temporarily, doing the best they knew how, that is, and it wasn't perfect, we all know, and, and probably enters our mind, well, my dad, I mean, there were times when it was unfair or it was neglected or whatever. I'm not denying that, but I'm saying that God is our father and he knows exactly what we need. He does it out of love. It proves that we're his children. And it is important for our training to finish the race, to run the race well. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. It's always good for us. In fact, if you look at some of the things that it does here, what it's stated, his discipline is always good for us. We share his holiness. As we go to the next verse, the last verse in our passage, verse 11, no discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's not enjoyable. It's painful. But, if, but afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who who are trained in this way. That is, so what happened? What is, what's the result of this? It is good for us. We share in his holiness that uh, there's a peaceful heart. There's peace that comes into our lives. There's right living. We live the right way. For those of us who've been trained, I love this word. It's, another, it's a different word. It's gymnazo. Uh, the Greek letters that start the word are G-Y-M. Uh, it is the basis for our English word gymnasium. We are being gymmed. That is, by the bad things that come into our life. They are conditioning us to run the race, to live life, to live it uh, productively and to benefit from these bad things. Now, I know that probably one of the first questions you're asking, does that mean, Woody, that everything that comes in, all the bad stuff, the difficult stuff, the painful stuff, is that all from God? I really couldn't say that. I don't know. I don't, I'm, what I do know is this. I don't necessarily think it's all from God. I really don't. We couldn't support that from Scripture. But I believe that all of it could be used by God to instruct us. It's like the Romans 8 passage, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. And that when we change our perspective, when we see it differently, when we have happened to us, what happened to me on that, you know, on that trail, as I threw that stick away, as I changed the perspective and as I said, God, I have been saying to you, shaking my fist at you basically and saying, what are you doing? Somebody up there hates me. And in that epiphany, in that moment, I chose, and that's what it is, a choice. I chose to say, God, I believe you are good. Because you see, the way you accept and look at bad things and painful things in your life really reveals and determines your view of God. And as A.W. Tozer, an old writer, says, what comes into our mind when we think of God is the most important thing about us. And God, if, he is, you know, if he's not good, if he's not trustworthy, I don't see how he can be much of anything else. And so this is right at the basis of our view of God and our response to God. And so I just realized that God, every, and I chose to believe this, and it's, and it's been huge for me, transformative for me. I chose to believe, God, everything that comes into my life has been sifted through the hands of a loving God. And it has made all the difference. And so that's the perspective. That's the change that has to occur. It is uh, like Robert Frost's poem, you know, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And I don't know if you remember the, the poem. It's one of my favorite poems. And he took the road less traveled by. And it made all the difference. And so I would, you know, it, there's two different ways we can respond. It's like the joke I, I've told someone. In fact, made me a T-shirt with this joke on it. But of the father who had two little sons, one of them was an extreme pessimist, one was an extreme optimist. And he really wanted to address that. So one Christmas, what he did was with the extremely pessimistic son, he filled his room up with the greatest, the newest, the best toys. And with his extremely optimistic son, he filled his room up with horse manure. 
And on Christmas morning, he went, you know, he went down the hall to his son's room, and in his, in the first room he got to was his extremely pessimistic, um, pessimistic son, and where he left all the toys. And as he got there, he heard not laughter and joy and squeals of delight, but what he heard was crying. And we walked in and said, son, what's wrong with all these toys? He said, yeah, dad, but you know, they're gonna get broken and they're gonna go to date and people wanna borrow them and all that. And his father's just, you know, phew, is mystified. So he comes over to the, that son's room, he can start and goes on down the hall. He gets next to the, his little optimistic son's room at, where he put all that horse manure <laughs> and he hears him singing. And he says, why, what in the world? He walks in and says, son, why are you singing? And the little boy said, Dad, with all this horse manure, he's just shoveling away as hard as he can go. He said, with all this horse manure, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. In life, <laughs> we can choose one of those two perspectives, but they are based on the character and the truth about God. And they're based on an understanding and an acceptance of what God is doing. And what he is doing is as we run the race, he is building our character. He is creating a life for us. He is uh, giving us the opportunity to see life in two very different ways. It's, made, it's been huge for me. I could tell you about motorcycle accidents that you know, I end up in critical condition and you know, much of it because of the uh, faulty equipment, the nut that holds the handlebars. <laughs> but it, it was something that in retrospect, I see that I needed. In fact, in that case, I knew I needed it at the time. I can, t oh, even COVID, you, we can look at it as the worst, and it's a terrible plague on humanity, but it is providing one of the greatest opportunities for us as a church to come out of this differently, to see church and to practice church differently. But it all depends on the choice that we make. In fact, let me just give you a little exercise as we finish. Maybe you're with somebody as you listen to this, but you could do this on your own. But if, if you're with somebody, after we finish here in a moment, have you ever had a, a, an event, a, a period, an era in your life that you say, I would never go through that again for a million dollars, but I wouldn't take a million dollars for it? Well, that is the example of what we're talking about here. It was not pleasant, but it taught you something and it made you in some way who you are. Well, let me just fast forward to right now. Is there something in your life right now that is painful, that is uncomfortable, that is, you would classify it as quote unquote bad? I would love for you and I would encourage you to ask the second question. The first one was, have you ever had something like that in your life that you wouldn't go through again for a million dollars, but you wouldn't take a million dollars for it? Now, what is something in your life right now that is bad. That would cause you to wonder, why is God doing this to me? And would you ask the question, God, what are you doing? What can I learn from this? How can I become the person you want me to be? How can I embrace this even so that you make me into the person you want me to be? Because that choice changes everything. That choice determines, reveals your view of God, your experience of God, and hence your view and experience of life. It is the choice. The choice that I said earlier, and I'm just gonna finish with this, is a quote from Robert Frost, his uh, poem. And the last stanza goes like this. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere, ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and it has made all the difference. Home without 
all the question marks There is no space you love won't fill And I'll trade all my fear for peace of mind All my heaviness for burdens lie Set my eyes on perfect faith You'll finish what you start in me My heart will be an offering I'll trade all my fear for peace of mind And once again, thank you so much for joining us this Sunday morning. I trust that the Holy Spirit was at work in the middle of that sermon, that you were able to take home some truths that really spoke to you in such a unique, personal, and powerful way. 
And I also pray that you'll be able to enter into your week with a new perspective, a perspective that God is with you, that God is in control, and that the Holy Spirit will continue to guide you as you enter into this week. Thank you.